welcome back or welcome continued. Uh, so now, as, as promised, we have now dealt with phonons and vibrations in a solids, and we'll now slightly switch gear uh, towards also accounting for the electrons. And as it was the case uh, before, we have a little bit of a change from what uh, one usually thinks about. First, we had this idealist crystal structure uh, and went to real materials that are disturbed, in which this periodicity is disturbed, in which everything is more chaotic. And uh, this also translates back uh, uh, to the electronic properties. So for, such a, for the idealist crystal structure, you actually have this perfectly symmetric band structure, but everything is fine and is degenerate and everything is symmetric and in order. If you however try to measure such a, a band structure in a real material, you will not get such sharp lines, but actually you will get smeared out self energies that have a final width and uh, that are not at all as sharp as such a calculated band structure. And the physical reason lies again in the motion of the nuclei. And it's relatively easy to understand uh, how the electron phonon coupling, so the coupling of the nuclear degrees of freedom to the electronic one leads to this behavior. Imagine this idealized band structure where everything is sharp and we have a very nice uh, uh, a gap. As soon as we start moving some atoms, also, the respective conduction band minimum and valence band maximum will change, will change shape, might become higher or lower. And uh, uh, this gives obviously a variance in the different, uh, 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 in the actual value of uh, the energy levels. And if you average that, not for just one particular displacement, but overall, as it happens in thermodynamic equilibrium, you end up with this smeared out, not particularly sharp self energy. Uh, uh, so this band structure where uh, you still see the trends that there are some bands in some extent, but obviously you see also that on average, they oscillate around a certain average value. And one effect of that that is particularly uh, famous of uh, is the band gap renormalization. If you measure the band gap here in silicon, as a function of temperature, you see that it has a very distinct dependent on temperature. And this is not linear, at least in the beginning, and only becomes linear at high temperatures. This is a matter of fact, a quantum nuclear effect. The tail here is described by classical motion. We can extrapolate down linearly, and this would be what is called the bare gap if the nuclei would really stick to their static positions at zero K. But since quantum nuclear motion enforces that they even move at zero K, the bare gap and the actual gap at zero K differ. And this is what is called the uh, uh, band gap renormalization at zero K. So the difference between actually immobile nuclei and quantum nuclei at zero K. And uh, this is, can be quite significant. And this is one of the uh, effects that led to the development of different theories on how to account for electron phonon coupling and uh, in first principle calculations. Now, first way to do it is really, again, going the perturbative route. And I'll try to explain that in simple steps again. And here we will follow what we've learned about the harmonic uh, approximation already. So the simplest thing is, again, to perform a harmonic approximation for the nuclear motion and just assume that as, uh, as working as we've done before and we've discussed that. And then a second step to do a similar harmonic expansion or Taylor expansion for the actual electronic band structure and to look at how this uh, energy values would change as a function of the displacement of the atom. And this is exactly what we need to describe with perturbation theory. Now, usually this is not done by looking really at the eigenvalues here and at the band structure itself, but 
one looks more deeply using perturbation theory at the actual dependence of the Aconsham Hamiltonian uh, uh, on different wave functions. This is the so-called electron phonon coupling matrix elements uh, that fall out of such a density functional perturbation theory calculation, but that in other words are nothing else than the expansion coefficients in your Taylor expansion of the electronic structure. So out of that, you can then again calculate your uh, uh, electronic structure as a function of temperature. The nice thing about these elements is that the dispensator response is localized in real space. And this makes these calculations much more feasible. While uh, uh, since localized uh, uh, um, properties can be much more simpler uh, described and interpolated in real space. This is the typical approach used in literature you first do your density functional theory calculation, you do your density functional perturbation theory calculation and compute uh, your responses on a reciprocal space in finite Q grid. You then switch to real space where these interactions are localized. This enables a real space interpolation, for instance, using Vanier functions, and then do a Fourier transformation back to reciprocal space to get this kind of coupling elements along the whole Ryosin zone. And once you have them, you feed them in in your actual perturbation theory. So there, for those like in quantum field theory, there are actually two diagrams that have to be accounted for. If you do that, you can calculate again the expectation value of your electronic structure. And for instance, how the band gap changes uh, with temperature. Here you see that for, for silicon, and you see that different experiments and theories are very nice in agreement for silicon. You get a very uh, accurate production of what is measured experimentally. Now, the nice thing about that, you cannot only just calculate this kind of band gap renormalization and it's temperature dependent can also produce such nice spectral functions uh, uh, and then compare really to actual measurements. So far so good, but uh, in all the talk before we have been looking at what happens if we now have to deal with anharmonicity. And this we have discussed extensively why anharmonic effects are important. So, it's clear that this kind of theories work for silicon, but would they also work for other materials? And have we uh, uh, methods to actually account for unharmonic effects when calculating such self energies or, uh, or the renormalization of the band structure? Indeed, we have. And here I want to make a side by side comparison of a method that we've recently developed uh, to do that. So, as mentioned before, in traditional uh, perturbation theory, you would just use a harmonic approximation for the potential energy surface. Similarly, you would do a linear response Taylor approximation for the wave function. So again, you use the equilibrium wave function plus a linear term that describes how this wave function would change upon displacement. And then you use that to describe the whole dynamics along this harmonic approximation and to calculate expectation values for this perturbed wave function along this trajectory. To overcome this approximation, we first to switch to a fully anharmonic potential energy surface. So to account for all anharmonic effects in the dynamics. In that case, however, we can also no longer uh, uh, use approximated wave functions. So what we do instead, we use the fully self-consistent wave function that are calculated at each step of this molecular dynamics. And then we do an additional neat little trick that brings us back and makes us comparable to such a perturbation theory approach. We expand the self-consistent wave function in terms of the equilibrium wave functions again. Here we do However, not just a Taylor approximation with a linear uh, uh, constant derivative and just a linear displacement theorem. We use nonlinear, fully, uh, 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 fully nonlinear 
uh, expansion coefficients. So we just project them back. So this accounts for all uh, higher order effects in, uh, uh, in this expansion. One reason to do that is that if we want to account for the dynamics and then go back to a unit cell picture, this is quite complex otherwise. And this, let me explain that in a second before. If you think again about a perf we had perfect periodic solid in static equilibrium, we have this nice band structure, but to account for vibrations, we have to go to larger and larger and larger superstars. In turn, this implies that our Berlin zone becomes smaller and smaller. States of, uh, are folded back, the Berlin zone becomes smaller, and we get more and more chaotic behavior. And this is hard to disentangle then what is really happening in the fundamental Berlin zone. And here our expansion that involves the equilibrium wave function in the unit cell uh, structure allows us to unfold the band structure bell uh, back to the fundamental Brillian zone. And to give a, an example, this is clear that when we have a perfectly system, we then use this unfolding and regardless which supercell we use, we end up with exact same band structure in unfolded. If we include perturbations, however, if we let the nuclei move, this unfolding gives us back some weights. So the states are no longer sharp, but they become uh, 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 have different weights. And uh, we see that they have uh, some, some structure in there. Now, this is just one instantaneous snapshot for one particular configuration, but then, uh, uh, and this corresponds to the electronic self-energy renormalized by this Vibonic coupling for one particular configuration. In turn, we can then average over all the self-energies as observed during a full molecular dynamics turn and get the expectation value. So to see what would actually happen in thermodynamic average. Again, boring, but real example of, of silicon. If we choose large enough supercells and do that correctly here with AMD, we see again that we can reproduce a very nice spectral function. I mean, if you look closely, one can probably see that actually the, uh, the edge states have slightly shifted. So we see that the band cap is slightly changed. We see that the states are no longer sharp, but have a finite uh, line width. And as a matter of fact, if you compare that to a state of the art perturbation theory calculations for silicon, we see that we are actually in very nice agreement with what happens there and also with the experiment. So once again, silicon is more like a proof of concept because we know this is harmonic and we would not expect to an harmonic effect to play a major role in this kind of system. It is much more interesting if we now switch to a more unharmonic system. And here we will look at cubic strands and titanate, a perovskite that is quite challenging to describe. As a matter of fact, it's in a tetragonal structure at very low temperatures, so up to 100K, and then switches to dynamically stabilized cubic structure. Uh, what, that, what does this mean? If you look at high temperatures, at above high temperatures, above 100K, um, the system will look like as if it is localized here in this very symmetric cubic structure. However, this actually corresponds to as a saddle point of the potential energy surface. If we do a harmonic approximation here, you see the parabola points downwards and is no longer, uh, can no longer be used to describe the dynamics successfully. As a matter of fact, what really happens in the molecular dynamics is that your system jumps back from one of these two minimas back and forth. And so on average, it looks like a, as if being located here, despite the fact that this never really is. These minima actually here, those are those of the tetragonal structure, in which you see that this, uh, 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 that this 
actual uh, tetrahedra are slightly displaced with respect to another or tilted. And so sometimes it's tilted in one direction, sometimes in the other. And when it's hot enough, it moves back and forth fast enough so that it's in, uh, on average here in the middle. Now, even for this tetragonal structure here, we can compute the harmonic approximation. However, it will be again only valid very close here to the minima. When the temperature is high enough that we actually want to end up here, a harmonic approximation will break down. We're no longer to describe this transition. And in the very same matter, if we look on how, for instance, the valence state maximum energy changes as a function of this displacement, we see that the Taylor approximation works nicely down here if we are in one tetragonal minimum. But if we're far from it, it will not work as um, more. So we have to fully account for both the motion in this anharmonic potential, this is done via Benicio ID, and uh, for the vibronic coupling, so for the explicit wave function dependence along this molecular dynamics. Now, let me just mention in passing that strontium titanate is actually quite tricky to deal with. It has significant Van der Waals interaction, so we account for that both in the Benicio uh, 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 MD, but it does also has a strong lattice expansion. Uh, so here we use non-perturbative Benicio molecular dynamic calculations to account for that, and in all following calculations, this is accounted for. And you can actually read more details about it in the paper, uh, uh, but keep it in mind that this is a fact that matters as well here. Here I want just to, just to focus more, which kind of approximation play a role, why? And uh, this is the nice thing in this kind of approach, because here we can lift systematically the individual appro approximation and look what happens at which stages uh, uh, of the approximation. And for that, we we'll really start at a very standard perturbation theory approach where we have perturbative electrons and harmonic nuclei but I started in the very beginning. Then we will lift the first approximation. So stick to the harmonic nuclei, but calculate the electronic structure self-consistently. This has an advantage that by using harmonic nuclei, we can now compare between quantum and classical nuclei in an analytic fashion. And this way uh, you will see that this matters uh, and that this matters. And in the last step, we will also lift the approximation on a nuclear and looking at anharmonic nuclei and the full electronic structure. In this case, we only deal with classical nuclei because we're doing classical molecular dynamics and we get the exact solution at elevated temperatures. So let's do this step by step for strontium titanate. We start with experimental data and you see that at least compared to silicon, when we have a massive band cap normalization. So it's over 1 AV if you are at 1000K. So this is something that really massively plays a role in this material. If you think uh, uh, at the actual band cap and uh, uh, in the static limit and compared to the 0K renormalization, already at 0K is more than 0.1 EV that the band cap just changes due to the static nuclear motion according to experiment. So here we a massive band gap renormalization temperature. We start with standard perturbation theory. This very well captures the low temperature limit, especially at zero K here in this tetragonal structure where everything is expected to hold. We can reproduce it quite strong in normalization nicely. But the larger the temperature becomes, the stronger becomes the disagreement uh, uh, with the actual experiment. We actually uh, underestimating band gap uh, uh, renormalization by a factor of two at high temperatures. If we stick to the harmonic approximation and account for the electrons in a, uh, uh, non, in a self consistent fashion, the results do not change as much. The reason is pretty simple. If you constrain the nuclei to stay in these harmonic potentials, the electrons cannot even run out to this region where something different happens. So this is somehow a self-fulfilling prophecy if you use either the harmonic approximation for the nuclei or uh, for the electrons, since they're consistent with each other. But as promised, the nice thing about this kind of approach is that you now can compare what would happen with classical 
harmonic nuclei. And you see that indeed at zero K we would get the almost no band structural monolization due to the classical harmonic nuclei. Uh, but starting somehow 500K and above, we see that classical and quantum me uh, mechanical behavior becomes more and more similar. So this is the region where we can trust the classical MD simulation to produce correct results. And this is what we do when we eventually add the, the fully unharmonic calculations. So we lift all approximation and treat everything self-consistently. You see, immediately that we get a much, much stronger renormalization, especially the slope is not uh, a, a, a quite nice agreement with experiment. And if we, on top of that, at Freulich terms, these are, as it was the case for the dipole-dipole uh, uh, interactions in the harmonic phonons, these are long ranged interactions that are not captured in the finite supercells that we are calculating the MD here for. If we add this correction on top of it, see, we get a very nice agreement with the experiment. Um, this is nice, so we can now really see where the, what the nature uh, 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 of this band gap renormalization is. Here we can look at that more closely using, for instance, spectral functions. So this again, the spectral function computed with classical harmonic and up in each MD at 1200K. And it obviously looks noisy. This is a very unharmonic system with strong uh, unharmonic coupling. So I want to point you to this region here where you clearly see that the classical one has not changed much. Actually, it's, it's uh, uh, and the classical harmonic system is relatively sharp here. While in the uh, MD calculation, we see a strong normalization. So this valence back maximum has risen and gives rise to the strong renormalization. Now, such spectral functions are not just useful for extracting band gaps. There are many more properties hidden in there. Absorption spectra, effective masses, line widths, lifetimes. Here, let me just emphasize the effective mass. So there has been a long-standing and ongoing discussion about the effective masses in this system. It's standard DFD, both using LDA or hybrid functionals, always predicted uh, the effective masses in the conduction band to be much lower than an actual electron effective mass. While experiment measured effective mass that's larger than one electron. So there's a disagreement factor of two that con could not be actually reconciled uh, due to deficiencies and the electronic structure model. Here we see that if we correctly account for the unharmonic motion in our calculation and in our normalization, see that we get effective masses that are actually consistent again with uh, experiment. It gives us insights on, uh, on what is going on at this level. So, so far so good, but these are again only thermodynamic equilibrium properties. And I've promised you that we will eventually deal also with charge transport. Charge transport is even more tricky than the vibrational heat transport we had before. And this is why, because we have to deal with electrons now and fully quantum mechanical electrons that we cannot deal classically with as we did with the nuclei before. So let's review basic ideas about uh, charge transport again. Know that electrons in a periodic potential fulfill the Bloch theorem and that they uh, uh, follow the fermi dirac statistic. This already has to very important uh, consequences if you want to elevate, evaluate the flux of electrons. First, we can look on how this flux is defined in a semi-classical way. So with a charge of the electron, and this is clear, this is just the electron charge. Uh, we have an occupation number, and this is given by the fermi dirac statistic. And then we have a velocity of the electron. And this is the group uh, uh, and velocity of the angle, so the derivative of this band structure. Now, you know that due to time reversal symmetry, um, minus k and k have the same uh, a kind of uh, electronic band structure. And so also the average, the, the 
group velocity changes sign when switching from plus k to minus k. As a corollary, this means that if we have a fully empty or a fully occupied band, this will not contribute to any kind of electronic flux. So the only thing that matters are bands that are partially uh, occupied. And here we typically disentangle three different uh, kind of situation. Can have so-called n-type semiconductors. This means that uh, here the electrons are the main charge carrier. It's basically a situation like that where we have excite an electron from the valence band in the conduction band, valence band is flagged, so only the electron in conduction band has a, uh, an actual velocity and so this is the main contribution. Conversely, we can have p-type semiconductors. Here, the holes in the valence band are the majority charge carriers, or we can have metals, and in these cases, most of the cases we have electrons that are the majority charge carriers. And with that in mind, can again set up Boltzmann transport-like equations for these different cases and get uh, transport coefficients. So in that case, we have the uh, electrical conductivity sigma, we have the heat conductivity due to the electrons kappa, and we have the Cebic coefficients that tells you how much heat is induced due to uh, 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 charge transport and vice versa, how much transport is induced due to heat. Again, if you think back about how we discussed the Boltzmann transport equation for the phonons, it has a very similar structure. We have group velocities that tell us how fast electrons travel. If we have occupation numbers that tell us uh, how many electrons are there to tr uh, transport that. And then we have the respective transport property for charge, it's just the, the electron charge for energy. We have the actual uh, energies of, uh, uh, of the electrons. And then again, we have a scattering time or lifetime of this uh, 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 of these materials. Again, Group velocity equilibrium population can be easily calculated in band structure calculation. The scattering time is not. Actually, the scattering time can depend on very many different physical properties. On a first order, we can have uh, approximation, we can have electron electron scattering. So the correlation between the electrons. This is typically neglected because it is really only the dominant aspect if you are the very high electron density that is not typically found in standard materials, only really in very dense metals. The second kind of contribution that you can have, and this is the one we're interested in now, is electronuclear scattering. And here we can have defects contributing, or this is topic here, phonons, due to the fact there is vibrations in the solid, the phonons break the symmetry in the Hamiltonian, they break uh, these perfect uh, uh, electronic states and disrupt them and lead to a finite lifetime. The most easy and straightforward approximation to evaluate this is just to take the uh, lifetime out and assume it to be a reasonable constant. So you do accurate band structure calculation and assume a reasonable relaxation time. And this will immediately give you electronic transport coefficients. Here, for instance, one of the first calculations of this kind uh, in which this kind of formalism is discussed. Now, there are many codes to do that and this kind of approaches uh, have been used extensively to charge and to create up initial electronic transport databases. For instance, here just one example, one code that has been used in which over 48,000 materials have been charted. Um, if you think about uh, what we had uh, or we discussed for the four months first, you might be surprised that this kind of single relaxation time approximation where we completely neglect uh, uh, any kind of anharmonic and coupling effects is useful at all. And uh, the question may arise, why, why do people do that at all? And for that, you have to realize that the conductivity of our materials is, is driven by two different physical effects. We have the charge carrier density times the mobility. The mobility 
is the one thing that is limited by electron form coupling. On the contrary, the charge carrier density is a direct effect of the temperature and of the band gap. So it tells you how many free charge carriers do you have at a certain temperature. And it actually depends exponentially on the band gap and on the temperature. So due to the fact, this is actually the leading term in the actual conductivity. So uh, uh, this kind of approaches in which you only use the zero K band structure and neglect mobility and lifetimes give you good trends for uh, if you compare over different order of magnitudes. Obviously, if you start to focus in and really want to compare uh, materials that are very similar, then you have to dive in and look at mobility and lifetimes because those are needed for more accurate predictions. One way to do that is again, to go back to the electron phonon coupling formalisms that we've discussed before. As we had, as we calculated the electronic self energies, we have so far only looked at the real part of the electronic self energy, which actually gives us expectation value here of the structure. There is, however, a closely related imaginary part of the electronic self energy. And this gives us actually this broadness in the spectral function. This is the line width of the electrons or inversely the lifetime of the electron. So with the exact same formalism that is used in perturbation theory to calculate the band gap renormalization, it can be used to calculate also mobilities. For instance, this has been done here for silicon by disentangling even contributions from electrons and holes over the whole range of temperatures. And this is in very nice agreement here with experimental data uh, given, uh, given as dots. Again, this is again for silicon, a material where one can expect this approximation that inherently are included in perturbation theory to hold. It gets much more problematic when you go for elevated temperatures and for anharmonic systems. And we have seen that already for the band gap renormalization. So what can we do to do charge transport in that regime? Here, we built again on a single relaxation time approximation. I want to show you how one can somehow change that uh, slightly. Uh, uh, and to map it back to a physical picture that is reasonable and give you access to anharmonic conductivities. Now, we've seen before that the conductivity is intrinsically related to the group velocities, and the group velocities are intrinsically related to the effective mass. Now, we can use that because the effective mass and trace that back calculate this conductivity in a frequency dependent way. So not looking at a DC direct current conductivity, but at the actual frequency dependent uh, uh, conductivity. And then we get a term like this, in which we have the relaxation time entering twice. If we take the limit that the actual disturbance is field changing, is much larger at the actual lifetime of the electron, this reduces to a, a relaxation time independent kind of expression. This is helpful uh, uh, because we can evaluate then this AC conductivity at each time. Now, let me give you a little bit more schematic insight how this is done and what this actually means. So if we take this frequency dependent conductivity, we need to evaluate this actual effective mass. And this effective mass is nothing else than the square of this kind of operator that describes the transition probability between state NK and MK. Now, let me plot it here for you for a toy fictitious band structure. Here, this, uh, uh, frequency dependent conductivity is zero for a long time and then has two small peaks. What do they actually describe? They actually describe this kind of transitions from back here to up here and from here to up here. 
remember we have here occupation uh, numbers entering in so the only thing where we can have excitations either going in or out is from occupied states to unoccupied ones or from unoccupied, uh, occupied to unoccupied so this is the nature of this one similarly with a much smaller magnitude because we are much farther away from the further energy we have a small uh, uh, transition probability here but at uh, uh, low frequency we see nothing at all now we feed that in in Kubo's linear response and evaluate that as a thermodynamic expectation value so formalism you can can feed all that what we've discussed in an independent particle picture then use the Heisenberg picture and we end up with such an expression which is nothing else than the actual optical conductivity so the frequency dependent conductivity evaluated in thermodynamic equilibrium what does this mean here we're doing again a thermodynamic averaging. So there's no rigid band gap approximation or the renormalization of both uh, band gaps, effective masses, and everything is intrinsically taken into account. There's also no perturbative expansion. So we do everything consistently with self consistent wave functions. And then we get this kind of uh, uh, expression, and we can again evaluate it uh, 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 for this toy system. As a reminder, here we have no actual transition because this would require phonons. Non vertical transition would require someone to take up the crystal momentum from the electrons. So this requires a phonon. If you just double the supercell but do not perturb the periodicity, nothing happens. But even if this indirect transition now has become direct symmetry still forbids this transition electronic structure theory knows that this have actually a different momentum operator as soon as we however break the symmetry we see that there is a sudden increase in thermal conductivity uh, in tr uh, conductivity in the zero frequency limit and if we do that for not only one but for multiple configurations, so by sampling real, what happens if we move this atom back and forth? You see that we see that this conductivity gets an average finite value here. You see that you have actually quite interesting effects on the band structure. There's a band gap opening up due to this motion. You see that there's density of states quite changing. You can then evaluate the electrical conductivity. This is nice, but it requires you very large supercell to do it. This incorporates all kinds of anharmonic effects and works very well if you are at extremely high temperatures in system in which essentially all periodicity has been lost. For instance, this has been used to describe something like dense liquid hydrogen. It means essentially a liquid hydrogen that is close to metallic uh, at very high temperatures up to 50,000 50, K at it's encountered in planetary systems. However, it's much more challenging to apply this kind of methods to the materials that we're studying, uh, typically material science, because there to actually really sample correctly all point of transitions, you need excruciatingly large uh, supercells to really map all transition back to a single vertical transition. And so, this is a challenging topic of research in this field already. And this brings me to my summary part two. Uh, my main messages were that the nuclear motion really does not only affect vibrational property, but also gives some feedback to the electronic structure. And this gives you principle to uh, observables, the real part of the self energy, which gives you a change of the band structure of their expectation values with temperature with motion and the respective imaginary part that gives you the finite lifetimes and broadening. So the uncertainty in measuring this actual electronic band structure. Perturbative approaches that build on the harmonic approximation and include also electronic structure perturbatively reach the maturity that really 
uh, allow you to assess electron and phonon coupling uh, uh, consistency, both for band structures and for conductivity. Unharmonic effects and accounting then is still a massive challenge in this field for the actual for the simpler problem of looking at just the renormalization of the band structure, we've done some progress there. Really calculating the lifetimes is an even more challenging uh, uh, issue and hopefully will be solved in the next couple of years. And with that, I'm finishing with the second part of my talk and I'm looking forward uh, to your questions and uh, your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, for the second talk. Um, questions? I see one in the chat by Roman. Roman, would you like to ask yourself the question? Uh, sure. So thank you very much, first of all, for this excellent talk. Um, I just wanted to ask if the backfolding of electronic structure is already available in FHA Um In principle, yes, it is. Uh, it is, however, not yet documented and tested in a way uh, uh, that I would like it. So if you feel experienced and uh, yeah, adventurous enough, just write me an email. I can point you where to go and what to do. Uh, don't expect polished output uh, or uh, full features already. So you have to handle it with care, but it's there if you wish to. And I think it will be finalized in the next actually a couple of weeks once people really that you will encounter today during the tutorial have been very busy preparing the tutorial and I hope that now then when the tutorial is over they can go back also finishing the polishing of the uh, uh, unbent structure unfolding so it's a matter more of weeks than of months let's let's phrase it like that thank you very much there is a raised hand by Badal hi thank you uh, so, uh, so from your summary first point, you mentioned this nuclear motion affects the electronic structure. So I was wondering what, uh, so how important this electron, um, this electron phonon coupling in heavy systems, I mean, uh, heavy nuclear system, for example, uranium or something like that. Uh, you have to be careful. I mean, uh, I think oh, uh, I, I'm not switching back. I had that in my first talk. Uh, there are two things entering. People often think about it's heavy, then it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. uh, that does not mean the frequency is, if you think about it uh, uh, in terms of spring constants, you have the spring constants over the mass. So if you have even a massively very uh, heavy atom, but it also is in a heavy interaction with something else. This will give you high frequencies and that massive motions. Uh -huh. uh, on the other hand, you can have a very light system uh, 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 that is not affected by, uh, by these things too much. So, so you have to be careful when thinking about it, what happens where and when. And same is done for the electron phonon coupling. Uh, this is a matrix element, and that so uh, it's not just how heavy is your atom, but how much does your electronic structure couple to this motion, and this can also be very large in a, uh, a very heavy atom, even if it does not move that much. Okay, so so at least we should check that whether it is important there or not for system of interest. Exactly. I think that this, the, your mileage may vary. I mean, okay. you can you can see if you think about, for instance, silicon. Uh, I had something like a band gap renormalization of fifty milli electron volt. Uh, diamond has more than zero point one. I think it's zero point one five eV, just because it's lighter and stronger bound than silicon. Strontium titanate. We have seen a renormalization of one eV. Uh, despite the fact that strontium titanate is much, much heavier than something like uh, uh, diamond. Uh, okay. 
Uh, I have few, uh, two more questions. Uh, you mentioned about this anharmonic effects. I mean, this is still a challenge. How, I mean, how far is it? Uh, can you give some ideas? It's, okay. Can you repeat the last sentence? It just was a bad connection, sorry. Uh, so, so this anharmonic effects is still a massive challenge. Yeah. Uh, how far is it in, in terms of maturity kind of thing? I mean, I think I, I, I tried to show this case of strontium mm -hmm. titanate where really in principle all harmonic effects have been accounted for uh, but that was essentially for the real part of the self-energy and uh, in principle you can do the exact same thing for imaginary parts of the self-energy so to then also calculate charge transport out of it there the main hurdle is, is numerical uh, um, the imaginary part of the self-energy is much more sensitive to uh, numerics, to convergence, to k-point densities, and so on. So it's, I would say that the conceptual hurdles are taken, but numerically can still be tricky. Okay, and I have a last question, probably kind of a stupid question. Uh, can you give a kind of estimate of time? How, I mean, how much it, how longer it takes in comparison to simple DFT calculation if we want to do this, uh, let's say electronic electron phonon coupling. So I have no idea. So can you give him just an idea that how how it, how much extra time it would need? Probably yeah. uh, uh, approximately thirty atom system. I mean, uh, 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 I would say. I mean, this is very hard to compare because uh -huh. it's very different yeah, calculation sure. involving different steps. Uh, I mean. I would say uh, at least an order of magnitude more. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, okay, great. calculating uh, uh, probably even two. Uh, I would say like that because probably calculating an electronic band structure nowadays uh, you can do within an afternoon uh, if you're an experienced DFT user. Uh, why something like that uh, uh, can take you hundred days, so up to three months until you have tested everything. Okay, okay. That's okay. less, I think it's less computational time. It's just that people are, are, are more generally, one has less experience with it. And so one has to be more careful. It's not just a routine calculation like a normal electronic band structure. Okay, great. Thank you. I have a question um, uh, regarding the um, conductivity uh, so in case of magnetic systems um, where what is the temperature range where uh, one should worry about this magnetic degrees of freedom contributing to the conductivity i mean it's a very interesting question uh, uh, but unfortunately that I have no hard answer to. I mean, uh, it depends very much uh, how strong your un, uh, magnetic effects are, how long, uh, how strong your other conductivity is. I think there is no general answer saying, okay, uh, uh, up to this temperature only this thing matters. It really depends on your system. Yeah. So various um, material that you have shown already, in those cases where. The exper it doesn't match with the experiment. Like um, there is a factor that also the spin can contribute, right? So where should I? What is the um, quantity to look at? Where is it coming from? Only anharmonicity um, or some other effect coming from spin? So I mean. Here in the system that, uh, that I've looked at, there were all uh, non-spin quantities. There was no magnetism there. So this was all without magnetism. If you get into magnetism, you have to look uh, 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 also at all kinds of spintronic effects. Uh, and there it uh, very much uh, matters how strong they are. Uh, and I mean, this varies very much from one material to the other. Uh, so the materials I've showed here where this uh, magnetic effects are essentially not present, uh, one does not need to worry about, but I mean, sure. you can have ferromagnets, you have, uh, can have all kinds of things where 
the magnetic effects dominate over all others and you don't have to worry about anamonicity then anymore. Uh, but then you have really to look at, at how strong your uh, magnetic interactions are and about how strong all this kind of magnetic conductivity is, which requires to calculate all different kind of matrix element that I've not covered here. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So one more question in the chat by Jin Kai. Um, Jin Kai, you want to ask yourself? Okay. Hello, Chris. Uh, thank you for, for a nice talk. And I have a short question. Uh, I, I'm wondering, does the green Kubo method including, uh, include both electron thermal conductivity and lattice thermal conductivity, like uh, we calculated in the part? Okay. Uh... I just go back a step to, to make clear uh, 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 what, what is what. Uh, there are so-called Kubo formulas uh, and they are general formulas for all kinds of transport coefficients that relate a certain transport like heat transport to the uh, uh, autocorrelation of the heat flux, charge transport to the uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, to the autocorrelation of the charge flux. These are the Kubo formulas. Then there are in principle formal implementations of that. And for the thermal conductivity of the vibrations, this is, are called green Kubo methods because they use the Kubo formulas and green was the one first formulating it for a vibrational heat transport problem. Uh, Conversely, you can formulate a Kubo-like thing also for electronic transport. And then they're called Greenwood Kubo formalism because uh, unfortunately a very similar uh, a surname Greenwood used this kind of approach to formulate them. So uh, the Kubo formalism itself works for all transport systems and it depends very much which kind of flux you put into them. And uh, if your flux is electronic and charge in nature, it will work as well. And historically, it's then called more of a green wood Kubo formalism because it goes into that direction. Does, does that help? Was that the actual question? Okay, okay. Thank you.